we'll start um, with, uh, similar to what we did yesterday, um, by exploring some of the main challenges with a few questions to uh, our Director General. Um, and the first one being uh, maybe a bit of a recap from what we did yesterday, but really in uh, October of 2021, 20, uh, uh, the airlines committed to net zero. Um, it's been a year and two months since then. Um, how would you sort of rate what's happened since then? Yeah, good morning again, everyone, and uh, thank you for your company last night at the uh, dinner. Um, so, Tony, as you've said in your introduction, uh, this is the, the most important issue facing the industry. Um, despite the very deep and prolonged crisis, uh, it's been great to see that the industry has remained absolutely committed <laughs> to addressing their uh, environmental impact. Uh, I think it is noteworthy that you know, in the middle of that crisis, we came together to agree uh, a target of net zero by 2050. Uh, that was a, a change to the previous target we had, which was a 50% reduction in net emissions uh, by 2050. And we recognized that there had been a change in the science, a change in the ambition uh, of most governments around the world. And we felt that it was important that the industry align uh, with the latest uh, thinking and the latest uh, ambition on climate change. Uh, in the year and so that has passed, um, I think the most significant development was the uh, ICAO uh, assembly held in Montreal at the end of September, early October of this year. So almost exactly one year after we had committed to net zero, um, it was very positive to see that uh, governments around the world regulators came together to agree on what they call the long-term uh, ambition um, target goal of uh, net zero by 2050. So we are now aligned. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, word ambition is something that needs to be strengthened. Uh, we need to turn that now into a hard plan for action to demonstrate how we as an industry can get from where we are today to net zero in 2050, working with governments, regulators, countries around the world to uh, align our interests and align our approach. But uh, I think that was a very significant achievement, uh, not to be underestimated, because reaching agreement amongst uh, countries, in many cases with different levels of ambition on climate change, was an important milestone. Uh, so getting the uh, agreement in ICAO in uh, October of uh, this year, I think, was a, a very positive development. Okay. Um, also at ICAO, there was the agreement on Corsia. Um, and how confident are you that that Corsia agreement is going to protect the industry from a proliferation of taxes, charges, environment reporting regimes? Yeah, it, it should do. Certainly the wording um, makes clear that uh, there shouldn't be duplicative measures, you know, that Corsia should be the single uh, market-based measure to be used. Um, I'd like to think that that will translate into hard commitments from countries around the world, but I, I, I think realistically, as we've seen in the past, there will be some countries who will continue to see this as a, an opportunity for them to raise revenues through taxes in the name of the environment. None of the money, as we've seen in the past, will actually go to uh, address environmental issues. So there's always a concern that despite that agreement, uh, we will see uh, some uh, countries move to take additional measures. Uh, now, I think um, it's important to highlight that Corsia, I've always said, in my opinion, Corsia is a good first step. You know, the idea that Corsia is the solution would be misleading. I think Corsia is part of the solution. Uh, and we've always recognized that. What we think is important is that it demonstrates that you can get together globally and agree on a system that should be applied. Um, the uh, important debate in uh, ICAO uh, at the assembly was the, the baseline for Corsia. Uh, the original intention was that the baseline would be the average emissions of the industry in 2019 and 2020. Uh, and they decided to average it over two years to sort of iron out any uh, minor disruption. Uh, they didn't clearly anticipate what we saw with the uh, closure of borders and the impact that that had. Um, so there was a debate around whether it was 
appropriate to continue with the average of 2019, 2020. Earlier this year, they, uh, a number of uh, countries agreed that it should be the uh, 2019 emissions as the baseline. At, at the assembly, what was agreed was that that wouldn't demonstrate sufficient ambition about the Corsia scheme. So the assembly agreed to set the baseline at 85% of the uh, 2019 emissions. So in other words, the offsetting, and in 2019, international emissions for the industry were about 606 uh, million tons of CO2, about two thirds of the overall emissions from the industry at uh, around 915 uh, million tons of uh, CO2. So th the baseline uh, then is the, the, the uh, if you like, the, the point at which we start offsetting. Uh, so it will be at 85% uh, of the uh, 2019 em uh, emissions. So Corsia, yeah, I think, uh, very significant to get a, international agreement on that. Very significant that uh, there continues to be strong support internationally for Corsia. Uh, we've got to make sure that now the, the system actually functions in the way it was designed to do. Um, I'm optimistic that it will, but I do recognize that uh, you know it isn't going to be the only solution. And as most people in this room will be aware, the Corsia scheme runs out to 2035, and there's clearly action that will be required beyond 2035. But I would fully expect there to be additional debate around the functioning of Corsia in uh, the years ahead. Okay. Um, and in the, the people in this room, in the press, we've seen some uh, skeptical reporting on offsets. Are, are you convinced that the system around Corsia will ensure that we've got quality offsets in, in play? Yeah, I think that's very important because it is fair to say that some of the early um, offsetting schemes that were used were questionable in, in terms of whether they were actually uh, achieving any real um, environmental um, positive impact. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's understandable why people have challenged uh, the value of offsetting. I think the important point in relation to Corsia is the, the, the auditing and quality control around the offsetting approved under Corsia is top class. And that, that, that is something we can take comfort in that, you know, it's not just any offsetting scheme or any scheme that slaps an offsetting label on it. Uh, there are strict criteria that must be achieved uh, before the offsetting can be considered applicable under the Corsia scheme. So uh, that should give people comfort uh, that the scheme is genuine, is credible, uh, can be verified, can be audited, and will lead to a direct environmental uh, impact, a positive impact on the environment. So uh, from an airline point of view, an airline industry point of view, that's very important to us because we're going to be spending billions supporting this scheme. We want to make sure that the money we're spending genuinely achieves the objective that has been set. So you know, we're not interested in pursuing a scheme uh, that is going to cost the industry money but doesn't achieve an environmental bene benefit. So I think uh, this is an area that uh, clearly a lot of attention uh, will be focused on the, the scheme to ensure that uh, offsetting under Corsia does have genuine positive environmental impact. And I, I'm very confident that that will be the case. Okay. Um, changing tact a little bit, we've been talking about governments, but how about the other um, participants in the industry value chain? For example, the OEMs, the, the engine manufacturers, uh, aircraft manufacturers, uh, fuel suppliers, have they come, have come up to your expectations for where they would be moving at this time? No, they haven't come up to expectations. I, I think that the positive is they've all made that commitment to net zero in, uh, in 2050. My concern is that they're, you know, they're making the commitment but expecting us to deliver on it, uh, and that's not good enough. Um, no, now, uh, you know, we have been stressing the importance of sustainable aviation fuel because of the uh, impact that that will have on our uh, abatement uh, getting to net zero in 2050, where we estimate that it will account for about 65% of the uh, CO2 abatement that we will need to achieve in uh, 2050. But there are other elements there. Obviously, there's 35% that will come from uh, other parts of uh, the value chain, if you like. Uh, that includes the OEMs, both airframe and engine, uh, where we're expecting them to continue to improve their performance. 
I don't think they can rest on their laurels. Um, we're not factoring in any significant amount from hydrogen. Uh, you know, Airbus have talked about a hydrogen-powered aircraft from 2035. Uh, personally, I, I think there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered in relation to hydrogen, and we don't have the answers yet. Uh, the critical issue being, you know, hydrogen, from my point of view, hydrogen is only part of the solution if it's genuine green hydrogen. And we're a long way away from having uh, sufficient volumes of green hydrogen available. But there will be some discussion about that later on this morning. Uh, we also need, um, you know, to continue to shine the spotlight on the structural inefficiency in the air traffic control system. Uh, you'll have heard us talk about this uh, year after year. And, and some people have challenged me and said, would you not just give up? You know, it's never going to happen. We're never going to see a single European sky. So why do you keep going on about it? And I keep going on about it because the impact, the environmental impact of a single European sky is so important. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's well documented that if we had uh, an efficient ATC environment in Europe, we could reduce CO2 emissions by at least 10%, and some would argue 12%. Indeed, there are some who believe it would be more. And this is a huge reduction in gross emissions. You know, th this is real impact in reducing CO2 from the industry. The technology exists. Airlines have already made the investment to ensure that the aircraft are equipped and can operate in a much more efficient manner. Uh, we need political will to address this issue. And quite honestly, it is, it is a scandal uh, that the you know, same politicians who will lecture us all about the need to improve our environmental performance are not taking responsibility for changes that they could uh, influence. And, and we see measures um, such as the measure in France recently talking about or implementing a ban on domestic flying where there's an alternative train uh, option for people. Um, you've probably heard me mention this before, but there's an excellent study that was uh, done by Eurocontrol, uh, which evaluated the CO2 emissions of uh, um, the industry in Europe. And what it showed was it, if you... If you eliminate it, every single flight in Europe of less than 500 kilometers, so, and typically these are the ones that they're targeting for uh, train replacement. Now, assuming you could do that, so for example, that would include flights between Dublin and London, some of the busiest routes in Europe, where there isn't a train option, and quite honestly, there never will be a train option. Uh, but if you could do that, you would reduce the number of flights by 24%, but the CO2 reduction would be in the order of 3.84%. So, you know, you see these politicians saying, this is the solution, we're going to ban short haul flying. Complete and utter nonsense. Uh, especially when you consider that if you reformed air traffic control in Europe, you would reduce CO2 by 10%. And that can be done overnight. You don't need to talk about an alternative infrastructure to support rail travel, which in many countries doesn't exist. You don't have to get into the debate around whether the rail uh, travel is, um, is zero carbon, uh, because obviously it depends on how trains are powered. You don't have to get into a debate around land use for rail or noise, which are significantly greater for uh, rail than they are for uh, aviation. So you know, we need to have this debate firmly anchored in data, uh, and the data demonstrates that the greatest contribution that politicians could make to this issue is to reform air traffic control in Europe and implement the single European sky. Okay. Um, you were talking about proposals of politicians um, on the banning of short haul flights, but we've also seen some people say, well, we should just fly less. H how would you respond to, to that suggestion? Well, I, you know, I think we all can make decisions around what it is we do in terms of our own behaviors. Uh, you know, do we change our diet? Do we change our, um, our forms of transport? Uh, you know, so it's not just about flying. Uh, we recognize as an industry that, you know, our contribution to man-made CO2, which in 2019 was about 2.5%, is significant. I, uh, I don't in any way uh, underestimate, you know, the significance of that. Uh, the, the issue for us is that as other industries decarbonize and they have, in many cases, easier options to decarbonize than us, our contribution will increase. 
I also recognize that there uh, are non-CO2 impacts from our industry. Uh, some of the science around that is immature, so we're still debating and researching that, and that is important. Uh, but the issue here again is let's, let's base these decisions on the facts. You know, if, if you uh, don't fly, does that really reduce CO2? Well, if the flight doesn't operate, it does. If it means that fewer people are sitting on the aircraft, then it clearly doesn't reduce the CO2 because the aircraft is still flying from A to B, it's just flying with fewer people. So we need to be sure that the measures that are being taken actually lead to the objective of an improvement in the environmental performance. And that's why I think some of the measures that have been discussed you know, sound good, but will they really make a difference to the uh, carbon footprint? Um, well, in the case of banning short-haul flights, not going to have the impact that uh, some politicians would lead you to believe. Right. Okay. Um, and we've been talking specifically about aviation's uh, role, but or a aviation's activities, but that fits into a global approach to trying to uh, fight climate change. H how do the efforts of net zero align with what we're seeing in the COP process, for example? Yeah, I, I think it's, it is uh, very closely aligned. Um, and it, it's good that people are coming together with a... Uh, if you like a single target. Um, now, we, we have to acknowledge that you know, our original ambition of 50% uh, net reduction was aligned with the, the science and the thinking at the time that we uh, agreed to that target. Uh, we're now aligned with the latest, you know, the, the Paris Accord. Um, I, I think the science could well change between now and 2050 as well, and that leaves us open to having to uh, change our targets, which we're open to do. You know, th this is a this is a, uh, a dynamic situation, and it's important that we're, we continue to uh, engage, to understand what's going on, to uh, progress the science, particularly in relation to non-CO2 issues. So uh, I think um, the, the positive here is that pretty much everybody is now ali aligned around a common goal, and that should make it much easier to ensure that the policy framework that governments and regulators have in place are genuinely aligned to assist, from an airline point of view, to assist us in the transition to net zero in 2050. So, you know, I've always been positive about the, uh, uh, the industry's commitment to the environment. I've become even more positive and convinced when I look at what airlines have been doing over the last few years. Uh, particularly in the, you know, as I said, in the depths of uh, this crisis, the commitments that airlines have been making to uh, purchasing sustainable aviation fuel, investment in technology around carbon capture, investment in new technology aircraft, uh, the um, measures that have been taken to improve their operational performance. These are all critical developments, and we're all happening at a time of significant crisis in the industry. Okay. You mentioned carbon capture. What's your outlook on um, sort of the, I suppose, the potential for that in uh, abating aviation emissions? Well, uh, you know, um, it's being done on a small scale at the moment, but it is part of the solution. And we have a number of our airline members who are making significant investments in carbon capture uh, technology. So when we looked at the pathway to net zero in 2050, we recognized that there, you know, there was no one single issue that could get us there. It was going to be a, a combination of issues, the biggest part of that being sustainable aviation fuel. But carbon capture and storage, all other options uh, you know, will be part of the solution. So we don't see it as being a, a key part in the early to medium term uh, transition to net zero. But certainly in the, the latter stages, when the technology around carbon capture uh, improves and the cost around carbon capture improves and the scaling of carbon capture improves, that clearly will be part of the solution as well. And we're also, it, because it is important, looking beyond 2050. You know, net zero in 2050 is great. That can't be the end goal. There's got to be further action beyond 2050. And that's where I see a lot of the nascent technology uh, the discussions that we're hearing around hydrogen, for example, I think these are all going to play a very big part uh, when we move into the, the next stage, which is, you know, what are we all targeting beyond uh, 2050? And I, I can remember, it wasn't that long ago when we talked about, you know, zero carbon aviation and people laughed, you know, that will never happen. 
it clearly has to be an ambition for the industry. And uh, you know, there, there are technological pathways to achieving that. I think the industry could look different um, if we pursue those or when we pursue those. Uh, but I think that's the exciting thing about our industry. The advances in technology that we've made have been phenomenal and uh, will continue to be so over the years. But we're not saying that we're going to get to net zero based on some magic that's about to appear 10 years from now. We're basing our pathway on known and proven technology that exists today that we know can be scaled up to make the commitment to achieve uh, the transition to net zero in 2050. Great. Um, so you've just taken us beyond 2050. Um, maybe if I can pull you back to 2023. Um, and what do you see in the, the next year as being the highlights or the key focus points for, for the decarbonization of, the, of aviation? I think in 2023, and again, we'll, we'll hear a bit more about this, we want to start seeing even greater evidence of production of sustainable aviation fuel. We want to see words, commitments that have been made by um, fuel producers turned into the reality of uh, production. You know, we want to see not just new entrants into the uh, sustainable aviation fuel market um, continue to make progress, but we want to see the traditional suppliers to the industry making a, a real commitment to uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I've, I've heard a number of these companies talk well about this for many years, but I've not seen much action. We need to start seeing action. But I think next year, 2023, you know, we need to see greater evidence of scaling up of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And while the, the volumes are still low, the path is in the right direction. Uh, but I think 2023 will be important for the industry to see further evidence in relation to the uh, development of uh, sustainable aviation fuels.